So we welcome to the next uh, part of the program, which is going to be anchored by uh, Chiranjeevi, Dr. Chiranjeevi Arra, which will uh, set off eight, I believe, uh, very uh, selective research, which is happening uh, under the ambit of uh, the Kohli Center for Intelligent Systems. So we have students who are going to uh, press in the videos online and perhaps also there to take questions on that. Uh, so Chiranjeevi, maybe I request you to introduce the students who are going to be there and, uh, and then leave the floor open to them. Yeah, thank you, Madam, uh, for the short introduction. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Chiranjeevi Yara, Assistant Professor, Language Technology Research Center, uh, AAA Hyderabad. So, on behalf of everybody, again, once again, I welcome you for the research showcase of uh, KCS uh, event. Uh, as you know, showcase of the research is the one of the critical part in our research journey, and AAA has uh, yeah, research in its roots from its start. So, we have on today we have around eight demos where they are show, showcasing their research work. These are all from their uh, different research centers from Triplet Hyderabad. So here, um, along with me, our organizing team members, uh, Nimi, uh, Madhav, and Avinash and Charu are available. And also the students and faculty related to those um, showcasing their research work also available. So you can ask your uh, questions and they will happy to address your questions. And uh, I'm requesting you to keep your questions in the chat box so that we'll read on behalf of you and uh, they will uh, going to address. So today uh, we have um, eight demos and one from Svetanjali Datta and group. And uh, second one is from uh, Vijay Sharadi Indurti and his group. And um, third one is from um, uh, um, Atreya Chandramouli and from his group. And fourth one is from Shishir Maurya and group. And the fifth one is from Shiv Gnesh and group. And um, sixth one is from Asistva Srivastava and group. And uh, seventh one's from, I mean, uh, Arvinda Gadam Sethi and group. And the last one is from, um, I mean, uh, Jashan he is supposed to join. We are waiting for him. So. So without any delay, let's uh, start the session. Uh, the first one is uh, from Svetanjali Dat Datta. So let me share my screen. So I hope uh, you can see my screen. So the first one is from um, uh, computer systems group. The title is Large Scale Cross Model Sports Analytics. It's from Svetanjal Datta, Shivan Rakesh, and Dr. Suresh Prana, Purini. Sorry. So let me play their video and then you can ask the questions during the video as well as at the end. Any questions from audience? Okay, there is a one question. So, Svetanjal, uh, I hope you can uh, unmute and you can uh, answer the question. The question is, uh, how did you evaluate the model? Uh, so, actually, in this uh, case, uh, so I think uh, it's mostly we used it for highlights generation. So, what we did is uh, we took the actual scoreboard of uh, 
of that particular match, this IPL 2021 finals. Uh, and then what we did is, for example, we had one query where we said that uh, show all the uh, boundaries played by one particular player, right? So what we did is we evaluated with the scoreboard. So in the scoreboard, it said, for example, three fours and one sixes. And then we checked that when we are putting this, whether actually three fours and one sixes was played by that particular batsman or not like whether are we missing any balls or not so that's how basically we did it so uh, i have a question uh, is uh, is your uh, architecture is it an activity recognition or can you a little bit explain your architecture which... right yes sir. so sir actually um, what the uh, actually our... Is it an uh, object recognition or segmentation or what? Uh, yes, sir. So, so we are mostly taking these videos, which are these recordings, which are available, and then we are basically uh, segmenting the uh, these recordings into constituent scenes called balls. But yes, one of the motivations for a system is we want to in future use it for activity recognition, then automatic maintenance of scoreboard, and so actually, so with this system, we can use to query a large number of uh, these small videos so we can have a lot of short videos of sixes and fours and things like that so that can be used to train an activity recognition so, so like for example when you say four show all the fours you 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 know the segmented balls and exactly. you make use of the scoreboard to Absolutely. to go and uh, segment that part which is the four so you're okay. not recognizing a four as well we are not recognizing a four but it's more of an information retrieval like using the scoreboard we are trying to retrieve these short clips called balls and uh, but yes one of our motivations was activity recognition system like which can be used uh, like we can train that kind of activity recognition system using this kind of uh, system so yes. sure very very interesting work and uh, good background music as well i mean yeah <laughs> yeah that's indeed uh, interesting and uh, it's a uh... Very interesting for the young uh, generation who are uh, really towards the cricket. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so any questions further? Or... Okay, so you can ask the questions to the student later also in the, our group also. So let me move to the next uh, demo video. Reading. So the second one is uh, from IRTL lab, LTRC, to play the about. So the title is Identify, Educate, and uh, Stop the Spread. So this is uh, from Vijay Saradi Indurti and uh, Professor Vasudev Varma. So let me play the demo video. Reading. Do you use social messaging platforms like WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal or Facebook Messenger? there is a very high chance that someone might have shared news with you through the platform. And there is a high chance that the news might be fake. People receive fake news through their social messaging platforms, and a lot of them forward the news to others without verifying the authenticity of the news. It is very likely that those recipients would also spread the fake news to more people. Hi. My name is BJ and today I am going to demonstrate a system that helps identify and educate the users of social media messaging and help prevent further spread of fake news. A recent survey showed that as much as 38% of Americans get their news from social media, websites and other apps. As social networks emerge, news is no longer monopolized by the newspapers, TV, and radio. Fake news is deliberate misinformation, stories intend to mislead the public. They can use sensationalistic and exaggerated content to increase readership and improve their advertisement revenue. Fake news can proliferate on social and even on reputed news media. Once the fake news gets viral, it is difficult to control and by the time it is controlled, the damage might have happened. Some of it can be irreparable damage like damage to property, society, and even loss of life. Many educated people think that they can identify fake news from real, but with the recent advancements in artificial intelligence and text generation, it is very difficult to identify fake news from real news. Many users, also known as mules, unknowingly share and spread the news without being aware that they are spreading fake news. Here are some examples of fake news. As you can see, fake news polarizes society, 
divides humanity, and can be a threat to democracy. When fake news is health-specific, it can cause irreparable damage, including loss of lives. Unverified claims can cause panic. Fake news is dangerous and as you can see, fake news on WhatsApp has led to the killing of people in India. Fake news can cause havoc in financial markets. Fake news can be broadly classified into multiple categories like misinformation, satire, sites mimicking original sites, hoax news, misleading news, and clickbait. Hoax stories are fabricated stories with an intention of misleading readers. They often report statistics and images out of context. Sites like The Onion show fake and satire news intended to be funny and entertaining. Fake sites often mimic the look of trusted websites to fool the reader. Clickbaits, though not necessarily show fake links, lure the user into clicking them and wasting the user's valuable time by providing content that may not be useful. As Mark Twain once said, a lie can travel halfway around the world, while the truth is putting on its shoes. A new study on the spread of fake news finds two important points, fake news spreads six times faster than a real news. In a given time, fake news spreads 30 times wider to more people. Social messaging services play a major role in the rapid spread of misinformation. With the increased penetration of the internet and the evolution of multiple social messaging services, there has been a steep increase in the number of fake news stories in recent years. Social media messaging accelerates the spread. With the support of groups or channels, it is easy for any user to forward any news to a large number of people. Any user with a smartphone can easily be a fake news spreader. Hence it is important to identify, educate and stop the spread of fake news. To combat the spread of fake news and misinformation, we build a pluggable system that integrates with the social messaging service. This system identifies and educates both the sender and the receivers about the possibility of potentially fake news and urges the users to refrain from forwarding the fake news. Thereby, it minimizes the spread of fake news and saves everyone from its aftermaths. To the core of the system lies a set of machine learning models or artificial intelligence that can detect the veracity of the news. We have models to detect fake news, clickbait, hate speech, and propaganda. The proposed system consists of a bot that can communicate to a social messaging system. In our case, we developed the Telegram bot, which communicates with the Telegram server and uses the machine learning models to identify fake and potentially dangerous information. It educates the sender and the recipients of the message that the content is potentially dangerous. It also visually displays the potentially dangerous attributes like fake content, political bias, propaganda, hate, and sexist comments too. Our proposed system is also easy to install. It can easily plug into any of the open APIs of social messaging apps like Telegram. For the user, it is as easy as adding a Telegram bot as another user into an existing group or channel. We tried to integrate with WhatsApp, but WhatsApp generally discourages bot-like activity. We may have to explore purchasing premium WhatsApp business API to integrate into the WhatsApp ecosystem. As the system is developed with a pluggable architecture in mind, it is easy to integrate with other messaging apps too. The secret sauce to our system consists of models developed using state-of-the-art transformer models. We use the fake and real news articles from the Nella GT dataset to train an AI model which can identify the fake and real news. Our results show that the models achieve an accuracy of around 85%. We believe that our technology can help people in identifying and curbing the spread of fake news through social media apps and can help create a better society in the coming years. Thank you for your attention. Please wait to see the demo in action. Welcome to the fake news demo. As mentioned, our demo is on the Telegram social messenger. You can see that the current chat is with the fake news bot. I am going to paste a link to an article whose content is not reliable. This article is from a site called dailycaller.com that is popular for publishing unreliable content. After sending the link, you can see that the fake news bot has analyzed the content at the link and has responded saying that the content seems to be harmful and adding a link that contains the analysis of the unreliable news. Opening the link gives details about the various analysis the fake news bot performed, for example, how unreliable the title is, how unreliable the content is, how much is the content clickbaity, whether the content has a political bias or not. It also analyzes propaganda, hate, and sexist language in the content. It analyzes if the content is machine-generated or not. As you can see, in this example, 
the content does not seem to be machine generated content. Let's paste another link from the website buzzfeed.com which is a popular site for publishing clickbait content. As soon as I sent the buzzfeed link, the bot has made the report of the content. In the analysis report, we can observe that the clickbait content is very high. It also analyzes and reports that the content is not very reliable. Let's paste another link pointing to artificially generated content. I paste the link and send it to the bot. The content at the link is automatically created using AI techniques for text generation. As you can see that the bot has responded with the analysis. Observe from the analysis that it shows a very high percentage of machine generated content. It also says that the title and content are both unreliable. This bot can help identify offensive content also in the group channels. See what happens when I send this offensive content. As you can see, it immediately identifies that the content is offensive and informs the user. You can see two more examples of offensive and insulting content here. As you can see, the bot is really helpful in identifying unreliable news and hate content which is usually seen in social messaging groups and channels. This concludes the demo. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Um, so any questions? Okay, I have one question. Um, so you have trained the model from the data what you have chosen that NELGT, right? So if let's say the text is from the un, untrained source, okay, then how effective your model is? That was, that's a nice question, uh, Dr. Chiranjeevi. Uh, so, the primary goal of any artificial intelligence system is the ability to generalize to unseen examples or unseen situations. So, when I said that our models have an accuracy of 85%, which means that if you give 100 unseen examples, it can correctly or accurately predict for 85 of those. So, uh, to answer your question, uh, it is accurate up to 85%. So there is 15% chance that it can actually give a wrong answer. So this is for the unseen examples. Thank you. Okay, I mean, um, I mean, um, my question is not unseen example. It's like an unseen source itself. Let's say, let's say I train your model with certain source of fake news. Now I want to test it or I want to analyze the fake news from another source. So. That's the little bit, uh, I mean, how much uh, accuracy dip you can expect from your models? Uh, yes. Because, uh, I mean, every time you can see that the fake news source itself is changing from time to time, right? So I'm just curious about that issue. Yes. So fake news doesn't know the whole, what is true or what is false. It analyzes cues in that text, uh, which says like propagandistic or uh, hate speech, or uh, it looks for some of the cues which are very similar to the large number of fake news uh, uh, data set. So while fake news is not got, it cannot determine what is exactly true or not, but it can give an indication that this is more likely to be uh, fake because of so-and-so features which are present. So since it really doesn't understand the actual content, right, it uh, checks for the presence of these uh, slight cues or features. So it, the generalizability is very decent. So even the news which it hasn't seen also, it will be able to predict based on the language, style, and the content. Oh, thanks. So any questions from this? Uh, no, I, I don't have any questions. Okay, so if no more questions, let's move to the next one. Hello, my name is Atria and I'll be. Yeah, so the third one is from uh, Center for Security Theory and Algorithms Research Center. And the title is Efficient Algorithms for Prediction Centrality. So uh, Atria Chandramol is uh, here to answer the questions. Along with him, this work is done with uh, Sayantan Jana and Professor Kishor Kotopalli and uh, Dr. Girish Varma. Hello, my name is Atria and I'll be talking about our work on efficient algorithms for percolation centrality. 
This is a joint work with my collaborator Sayanta and professors Kishore Kotapalli and Girish Verma. Here's a brief introduction to the problem. When analyzing the spread of a virus, it is interesting to model the problem using a network. For example, this network can be a social network of people called a contact network, where the vertices represent individuals and there is an edge between two people who come in contact. Here we see that at each time step, the virus, which starts at vertex 1, spreads to its neighbors and eventually spreads to the rest of the graph. However, if we identify certain important nodes, such as 4 here, and shield them, we can prevent further spread. But how do we characterize this importance? Percolation centrality takes into account both the position of the node in the network, this is done via shortest paths, as well as how percolated these paths are. The metric is also used when modeling several other problems such as the spread of messages in a social network or the impact of marketing and the propagation of extreme ideologies in a community. And so usually in practice the graphs of interests are extremely large. For instance here is a relatively medium sized graph and it already has over 10,000 nodes and 24,000 edges. Our work tackles the scaling problem through three approaches. First. For the exact computation, we propose efficient parallel algorithms that use the decomposition of the graph into biconnected components. Our algorithms have a work complexity of O of nm. Next, we focus on how the measure changes with changes to the graph. When the state of a node changes or when new edges are added or deleted, instead of recomputing the measure from scratch, our dynamic algorithms can update only the vertices whose centrality values have changed. And these also make use of biconnected components for the improvement in performance. Finally, we handle the case where the graph sizes are too large for exact computation to be feasible. We propose an efficient randomized approximation algorithm and our algorithm produces estimates that are equal to the centrality values in expectation. So here's a small demo showing how our algorithms can be used in the case of real world graphs. Consider this example network. Initially, only node 16 and 24 are infected. And the degree of infection is represented by the color of the node. If we are interested in knowing which nodes to shield, we can use our algorithm to find the percolation centrality of all vertices. As we see here, the neighbors of the vertices 16, which is in this case 13, 14 and 3, and the neighbors of 24, which is 8 and 2, are highly susceptible and so should be shielded. Now suppose we fail to protect these nodes and the vir virus spreads to the neighbors. This can be thought of as a percolation centrality value update. After the changes, we see that the neighbors are of a deeper shade. Now, uh, how will the percolation centrality value change due to this? For knowing this, one way to do this would be to run the algorithm all over again. However, we can do better than that. We can run our dynamic percolation value update algorithm we get the following result and we see that the, the neighbors are further deep shaded as well as further neighbors are more affected and more susceptible. Let's take a look at another update. Suppose the virus spreads further, the shades are becoming even further deeper and more nodes being susceptible afterwards. What if two nodes come in contact with each other? Uh, this is actually an edge update in the graph. So suppose we want to add an edge, suppose 16 and 24 come in contact with these two vertices. Now that they are connected, how do the values change? To do this, we use our dynamic edge update algorithm. So as we see that the neighbors of 24 are now further susceptible. Similarly, we can model a preventing contact between two nodes as an edge deletion. So let's say we remove the connection between 10 and 13. Let's see how the values change. As we can see, the importance of 10 has gone down significantly, but that as a result of that, the importance of other vertices such as 17 has increased significantly. Finally, let's suppose we had to estimate the centrality values of all vertices. To do so, we can use our randomized approximation algorithm. As we see here, Running this gives us an estimate for the percolation centrality values and while they are not exactly the same as the actual values, 
they give a good idea of which nodes are susceptible and require much less time to execute. The exact measure here is an overview of a method. We first perform the BCC decomposition, and in this step, we store some extra information at each, vert each vertex. Next, we perform a forward pass to construct the shortest path DAG. We thus find the number of shortest paths from a source to a destination. In the backward pass, we use this information then to update a variable that we call dependency. When an update by a vertex is done, uh, we atomically update the percolation centrality values of that vertex. And finally, we scale the measure as per the definition. So we tested this on four classes of real world graphs, and we see that on CPU, there is a speed up on all graph instances. On GPU, our optimizations perform better on some instances and perform as well on others. We see that there are similar results also for the source destination version. Now for computation on dynamic graphs, when an edge is added or removed, we first identify the BCC where they lie. Similarly, if the vertex's percolation value has changed, we find the BCC corresponding to that. Then we check which, which vertices are affected using a criterion that is based on distance. We then run our update algorithms only from these affected vertices. Uh, here are the results. For the edge update case, we again notice that we have speed up on all cases in CPU or in GPU we perform as well or have a speed up in most cases. However, for the vertex percolation update case, we have incredible speed ups of up to 1000. And this is because our algorithms require only O of N M work compared to the O of NM work that is required to recompute from scratch. But efficiently approximating the measure, our algorithm performs similar steps to the exact one, but with two major changes. First, we run the algorithm only from a subset of starting vertices. And second, we modify the definition of dependency. And so the backward pass is different and must be processed differently. We experimentally compare our algorithm to existing ideas. Here they have noted they have been noted as A, B, and C. And we note that our algorithm identifies more high centrality vertices. It also has fewer inversions and has a much lower mean square error. So for further details, we implore you to read our papers as well as the source code, which is available on GitHub. You can always contact the authors here for more information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Atreya and team. So I think we have a few questions. Uh, let me read out. Okay. So yeah. So there are uh, three questions uh, from Dr. Charu. So first question is, what does the size of the node signifies? Uh, so the size of, uh, can you hear me first of all? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay. okay. So the size of the node is the actual percolation centrality value. And that is what we are trying to compute. And so uh, in the demo, the larger the size of the node, the more susceptible it is to be infected by the virus. Okay. The next question is, uh, what is the approximation bound? Um, so for our case, our algorithm, the analysis we have done is only for the correctness, which is that in expectation that uh, our samples are equal to the actual percolation centrality values. Uh, because our samples are not independent, uh, we don't have a theoretical bound on the approximation guarantees, but we have experimental results that suggest that they are quite close. Okay. Nice. And uh, the last question is, are you looking for important node to stop the spread? Yeah, so the idea is that uh, an important node will be not only uh, somewhere in the middle of the graph, where like highly central in the graph, but it will also be visited by infect other infected nodes. So uh, uh, the way this criterion takes into account both of them. And so that's why it is an effective uh, way of identifying important nodes to stop the spread. Okay. So th those questions are really nice questions and enlightening and uh, your answers are addressed nicely. So yeah, I think uh, we'll move to the next one. Uh, 
any further questions you can uh, catch up the atreya and team so let me start the, the fourth one so the fourth one is from uh, center for uh, building sciences smart home energy management system and the team is uh, cecil mourya and professor vishalga and i hope uh, she is available for answering the question so let me play the video at the center for it in building science triple it hyderabad is developing a smart home energy management system also known as shims this work is a part of the indo uk project reside residential building energy demand reduction in india supported by dsc in india and epsrc in the uk shims consists of five devices smart energy meter smart socket door window open close sensor temperature and humidity sensor and ir emitter all these devices work on wifi these devices can be interfaced using a mobile app the mobile app also provides energy feedback and features for control and automation of home appliances two devices a smart energy meter and wifi based temperature humidity sensor are developed at triple it hyderabad other devices are procured from oem and are adapted to be a part of the shims currently we are doing a pilot in the smart home lab at triple it hyderabad and in 10 homes let us understand how each of these devices function we all know that every house has a main energy meter given by the utility or society which is followed by a distribution board from where all the electrical supply is given a smart energy meter is installed in this distribution board after the main meter so that it does not interfere with the main meter the smart energy meter collects the overall household energy consumption every second it also records voltage current and shares this data using wifi smart socket is another component in the shims which help us to understand appliance energy consumption it also allows switching the device on and off using a smartphone app we use it to measure the energy consumption of four major appliances ac refrigerator geyser and washing machine to understand the comfort conditions in an air conditioned room the temperature and humidity sensor is used it monitors indoor temperature and relative humidity we use the door window open close sensor to record the open and close events of the door or the window this will be useful to understand the usage of window for fresh air especially when the ac is being used the ir emitter acts as a hub to connect through all the shims devices it can also be used as a remote through the smartphone for an ir based controlling device such as the air conditioner features of shims shims provide visualization of energy consumption it gives tips and advices that enable energy saving it helps estimation of energy consumption in comparison with the peer group or the neighbors users can also automate switching on and off of the device through option of scheduling we understand that privacy is a concern hence to ensure homeowners privacy all the data is collected by an application hosted on a secure server located in india we use authentication that is based on the triple it hyderabad's account in india after successful testing in lab we plan to conduct field trials in 200 homes in hyderabad in 200 homes we will recruit 100 homes as the control group and the other 100 as the intervention group the intervention group is given access to various features of shims that enable energy saving actions the control group is not provided with any of these provisions that help in saving energy the control group will act as a reference group by comparing the energy consumption among intervention and control groups we will be able to estimate the energy savings achieved using shims 
This is first of its kind study in the country and it will help in further development of Eco Nivas Samhita developed by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. 2021 version of this code has provision for smart energy homes as a part of its annexure. We hope that the findings from our project will help bring different aspects of smart energy home as a part of the main code. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Moria and team. So, so any questions to the team? Okay, I have uh, one question while people are thinking. So, how uh, cost is that equipment? Let's say I would like to make uh, my entire home to be smart. So, how much? Uh, flexible in terms of the cost? Uh, yes, sir. like that is a very like, relevant question, like the cost of the whole installment. So we have currently limited it to 20,000. So uh, that would be the overall cost. So we want it to reach to the normal household people so that we can reduce the general basic load, base load of whole country. Because like uh, the, we are not just eyeing for the energy consumption, but we are eyeing for the reducing the general energy consumption of the general public. So it should be to re, uh, in the reach of every uh, or the most of the households because too much expensive system doesn't actually uh, show any relevance in the experiment if it cannot be generalized to the whole public. So that's what we have so far managed to figure out. Okay, thank you. And uh, by the way, in the, your uh, smart uh, socket, right? So how did you com make the stop communication between the mobile and the socket? So do you have any... Uh, uh, chip with connects the Wi-Fi. Yeah, so like uh, we have like uh, we, we have developed a, uh, an app. So what it happens, the whole all the devices are connected to the home Wi-Fi, and then there is a you have seen the IR emitter, right? So it also acts uh, as a hub. So whenever all the devices are connected, they can be centralized to that hub, and that hub sends the data to the Wi-Fi, and it can be connected to the server. So if you want to access it, you can access it through app. You can analyze your own uh, consumption. And also we are planning to uh, adapt it to a different kind an ILM model so that it can automate accordingly with a user specific consumption. For example, uh, two, uh, there are two families side by side, but according to their socioeconomic background, they might uh, consume uh, energy differently. They might use appliances differently. So the system will be uh, uh, like uh, able to adapt according to their consumption and it will automate accordingly so that it will reduce the consumption and it will turn off some uh, non-essential things when they are not in use. So that's the whole idea too. Okay. Yeah, this, your answer makes me a lot of questions, but I won't uh, bug you. Maybe I will bug you later. But um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. So one from Charu. So when will this be available in market? Yeah, so right now, like uh, this whole system is not available in the market, but we are going to install it in 200 homes by the end of this March. And the idea is to collect the data for whole one year across all the seasons in like a multiple socioeconomic background of 200 homes so that we can generalize this to the normal public. And once the data is collected, then we will uh, perform some analysis and we'll create some analysis models and different like uh, models. Actually, the whole idea is to give this data to the power ministry and utilities so that they can make uh, policies. So right now we have for consumption, to reduce the consumption, we have only demand response. And that demand response is applicable only to the uh, uh, industrial sector. Right now, there is no study for the residential one. So what will happen, our study will give them a plan's specific load profile. And with those, they can perform policies so that they can reduce the load. For example, what kind of appliances are being used? What are the star level of those? And how efficient are those? Even with the greater star level, sometimes what happens, the appliances might be consuming more energy due to inefficient wiring, or there might be some faults in the equipment, but you will not notice until it will shut down. That's the general mindset of the Indian people. So we are eyeing for the behavioral aspects of this also because energy cannot be isolated from humans in terms of behavior because we are the consumers so we define how we use it so that's how we are planning to make it available so the market availability might be it may take two or three years at max but we are trying to do it as possible actually the COVID situation okay. has changed it a lot otherwise this would have been done two years back itself yeah i agree so i think uh so next question is uh, from Asistva Srivastava. um how does the system analyze what to do for uh, saving energy? Are there any publicly available statistics that the system uses as a reference? 
yeah so first of all i would like to thank astitpu for this question because this is the whole uh, like selling point of our study so right now there is no publicly available statistic so what we are going to do we, the data that we collect is the reference statistic that will be available for the further study now the question coming to the question how we uh, how the system analyze what to do for the saving the energy so the thing is the electricity is a commodity that has to be consumed the moment it is uh, generated right so what happens whenever any appliance is turned on Uh, there is a sudden peak in the load consumption so according to that the generators in the power plant ramp up and they provide more energy so the load profiles that we talked about the appliance specific load profile they'll provide those peaks so when we observe those peaks then the system can learn that okay so in this in this time in this time frame uh, there is a certain peak of this much power and then by using all this data of different appliances it can uh, segregate into different uh, clusters and find it okay So this appliance is being used by this uh, by this household in this amount of time. So what I will do, I will uh, automate it and uh, turn it on automatically when the time comes and will shut down when it is being used. So if even if you like to forget to shut it down or if you are using more, the system will automatically uh, uh, curb it. That's how. So we are trying to learn it through the peaks and the load, the electric lo electrical load that we get from the smart sockets. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sishir uh, Maurya. And then let's move on to the next uh, uh, demo video. Let me start it. Long term exposure. Yeah. So the title of this uh, demo is uh, a Max Flow MCMC model for better management of urban traffic uh, pollution. This is from uh, Machine Learning Lab. so the team is uh, shri vignesh shuri narayana and uh, dr girish verma and uh, dr pravin parachuri so let me play the video long term exposure to air pollution causes a variety of health issues a study found that air pollution causes three times more deaths than hiv aids tuberculosis and malaria put together high volume of road traffic is one of the major contributors to air pollution all over the world If vehicles use the same set of roads frequently, it leads to high air pollution in the areas near those roads. Let us take the traffic scenario on this real-world roadmap from Seattle, USA. Suppose vehicles want to go from the blue marker to the red marker. We want to accommodate the maximum number of vehicles in this scenario, and hence we find a max flow solution. Let's say we apply the popular Ford Fusion algorithm and found the max flow solution we can see with the figure. Could all the vehicles use only these two paths to travel from point A to point B over a period of time? The pollution will get concentrated along those edges which are part of this path. In order to avoid concentration of pollution on a few edges, we can have multiple max flow solutions and alternate between them over a period of time. This will ensure that the pollution gets distributed across a larger area and prevent a high concentration of pollution in any area. We can also ensure that there is a bit of diversity among the multiple max flow solutions we use by limiting the number of common edges they have. In this figure, we can see the superimposition of seven different max flow solutions, and we can see that it uses a lot of edges compared to the original case. Max flow algorithms typically provide us with only one max flow solution. Therefore, we use a random sampling method in order to efficiently generate multiple max flow solutions. We start with a single max flow solution obtained from four focus algorithms. and keep making small changes to the path we modify the path by rerouting them using the faces of the planar graph as you can see in this image we keep modifying the max flow solution until it becomes diverse enough from the original solution this method will also be scalable for larger areas involving longer path in order to make our algorithm more easier to incorporate into real world scenarios we have some feasibility concerns If the alternate path suggested by algorithm are much longer than the original path, people will refuse to use them since it increases the travel time by a lot. Therefore, we assign a probability to each uh, rerouting operation based on the path. When rerouting a path with the face increases the length of the path, we allow the rerouting to happen, but with a probability less than one based on the difference in path length. However, when the rerouting operation decreases the total path length, we assign a probability of one. We also disallow any rerouting operation that violates the capacity constraints of an edge. We also limit ourselves to a smaller solution set. For example, a set of seven solution sets which can correspond to seven sets of three. 
because having a lot of solutions might end up confusing people. This kind of random country, where we start with one state and move to other states using a set of principles, is called a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Here, the state space of a Markov chain is to set up all integer maximum solutions from the given source to the given destination. That is, the set of all maximum solutions where the flow on every edge is an integer. The transition in a Markov chain happens by rerouting the path through the phases of the graph. The probability of transitioning from a state A to a state Y will be proportional to lambda power difference in path length of Y and X. We also prove that the stationary distribution of a Markov chain is proportional to the exponential of its total path length. That is, once the Markov chain is fully mixed, the probability of us getting a state as a random sample from the Markov chain will be proportional to the exponential of the total path length of the state. Here, we set lambda to a value less than 1 so that we have a higher probability of getting a state that has a lesser total path length. Let us see a demo of both Fulkerson algorithm and Maxwell Infinity algorithm on the Sumo traffic simulator. First, let's start with the Fort Fulkerson algorithm. As you can see, this is the Sumo traffic simulator and this is a real world roadmap of Seattle. So, once we start the simulation, we can see that in Fort Fulkerson algorithm, once a vehicle, the, the routes are predecided, since we are using a single Maxwell solution, the vehicles keep using the same routes again and again. So, that leads to the con pollution getting concentrated along these routes, whereas the areas nearby stay here and or do not have any pollution compared to that. So, this is what we aim to fight using our Maxwell MCMC algorithm, where it spreads out the pollution over a lot of edges and reduces the maximum pollution in any area. So, let's see some analysis on this simulation. So we can see the pollution heat map for the Fort Fulkerson simulation here. So as you can see, green is a pollution. Green corresponds to lower level of pollution, whereas yellow is medium level, and as purple, black, red, etc. are high levels of pollution. We can see that there are a lot of edges with colors that are not green, which indicates that there are areas with high pollution. Now let us check the Maxwell MCMC algorithm. Now this Sumo simulator opens again with the same Seattle map as before, but this time it's using the seven different maximum solutions which were generated by our maximum MCMC algorithm. So we can see that the first solution is using these parts. However, after some time when it shifts to the second solution, we can see that those edges are no longer used and some different set of edges are used. This means the pollution overall pollution gets spread out evenly across this entire area and it won't get concentrated along some specific roads or a small area. This will reduce both the max pollution and the average pollution overall along the edges traveled by the vehicle. So now the simulation got over. Let's look at the same analysis which we did for the fourth position. So as you can see in the heat map for maximum MCMC algorithm, we can see that most of the areas are in green color indicating that the pollution level along those edges are much lower than what was there in the port pollution algorithm. And the pollution is being spread over a large area and the overall maximum pollution is minimized. Areas of high concentration of pollution is minimized compared to the port pollution algorithm. We can see that the mean pollution and max pollution both have decreased from port pollution to our max pollution. However, the total pollution does increase. This is because we are finding alternate roads which tend to be longer than the original roads that were used by Fort Fulkerson. So, the increase in pulse length does increase the total pollution by a bit. However, the increase in total pollution is not that much compared to the decrease in the mean pollution and the max pollution. Max pollution. In conclusion, we have presented a full city scale traffic routing policy that prevents severe traffic pollution in any area. We have also designed a Markov chain Monte Carlo method that can sample integer macro solutions from a pre -map. Thank you.
thank you team um, revignation team so any questions here yeah so this is i think this is a really nice work and uh, maybe you can we can you, you can uh, have another feature in the google maps kind of thing i mean that uh, people can use the paths which are let's just say polluted so however i have one quick question that um, in your cost function did you include the the time taken from the source to destination as well as the if somebody take the little bit longer path uh how much cost incurred in the in consuming the fuel uh, is these two parameters included in your finding the less polluted paths yeah i'm out hello yeah what i'm asking is that um, i mean uh, typically if you take a longer path you're going to spend more money right so and also it will take la, la, more amount of time right so these two constraints are included in your uh, analyzing the path yes yeah, so when we are analyzing path the uh, marco chain which you used to sample as a parameter which we can use to uh, uh, specify our preferences for path length so if we allow like very long path lengths obviously the pollution will get spread out more but it will not be very useful for people on the other hand if we limit ourselves to very uh, small difference in path length we can't spread out the pollution by a lot so we can uh, we have a parameter called lambda and marco chain which we can modify according to our needs whether we want to give more preference to path length so we can simulate a marco chain see if it gives longer path lengths which people are not willing to use we can simulate it with a smaller value of lambda which will reduce the overall path length. i see okay thank you so let me see uh... So the videos are being played from your system, is it, Kiranjeevi? Yeah, from my system. A any problem? Any? No, 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 no. I no, no. I was just. So maybe people are thinking. I have one more question. Uh, what is the deployment plans for uh, uh, this algorithm to the Indian? situation because i think whatever uh, analyst is uh, done with a nice uh, city architecture but uh, in india we don't have that kind of architecture right so any thoughts towards this direction yes so regardless of how organized or unorganized the map is it will still be like a planar graph with the faces just that the faces shapes and everything will be different this can be transferred directly to the indian scenario as well but the thing is if we, we are presenting in an organized map for theater because it will be easier for people who are seeing it to visualize and understand it. Since the map is organized. Okay. Okay. Fine. Just for visualization purposes, like we can directly apply it to Indian maps. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any further questions? Okay. If not, let's move to the next uh, demo video. Let me start. Okay. Yeah. So this is from uh, Cognitive Science Lab. Um, the title is Cognitive Translation Using Brain Decoding. The team is uh, Josh Narora and uh, Professor Baprazu. So let me play the video. Hi. I'm discussing about cognitive translation using brain decoding. My name is Josh Narora. Let's get started. First question that comes to our mind is what actually is brain decoding? Brain decoding is the reconstruction of the stimuli from the information that has been encoded in the brain. Stimuli can be anything varying from image, text, speech, or video, or even a combination of these. Next, how do we represent what has been recorded or encoded in the brain? This is done using the fMRI scan, which stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging Scan. It takes a 3D image of your brain and captures all the activations in your brain. We can break down the 3D volume fMRI scan into various small 3D boxes called the voxels. Now these voxels are represented linearly. This finally gives us a feature vector with the length as the total number of voxels. This final feature vector is used in the machine learning experiment. A human brain has the unique capability of language acquisition, or basically uh, the process of uh, learning a language. 
So the brain, so the main goal of uh, building a brain decoder is to understand what the subject is thinking, seeing, or perceiving. And we, uh, as discussed above, we uh, do uh, we do it using the uh, fMRI imaging scan. Talking about some of the previous work, a famous work by Francisco Pereira titled "Towards the Universal Decoder of Linguistic Meaning from Brain Activation." Here, they built a decoder to associate brain activities corresponding to three different stimuli or views with the concept word. The three different views uh, were namely image, sentences, uh, and or a word word. Coming to the data set details, as told before, the, uh, for every concept or word, for example, word, uh, let's say, there are three different views uh, that are uh, a, a set of uh, sentences containing uh, the concept word, uh, a set of image, images for the word, and a word cloud consisting of the concept word at the center and semantically, uh, semantically similar words surrounding it. The data set comprised uh, a total of 180 concepts. So, so their task was to uh, decode uh, this concept word using the fMRI corresponding to the given three uh, views. For experiment two and three, there was a set of uh, set of forty-eight uh, broad topics, and under each topic, there were passages belonging to different subtopics. fMRI was provided for each of the same. A decoder was trained for experiment one, and and the same decoder uh, was used to decode the sentences in this experiment. So, this data set. Uh, Acted as a test data set for a decoder, which was actually trained on uh, the experiment uh, one data. Followed by the previous work, a new work titled Towards Sentence Level Brain Decoding with Distributed Representations uh, came. Here they actually explored decoding sentences, the sentences that we just, uh, 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 the sentences that were used in experiment two and three. So they worked on the same sentence data set. And they actually explored decoding uh, these sentences using nine different uh, distributed uh, representations. Sentences and these representations, like they were taken from uh, covering both the unstructured and structured model. Uh, unstructured uh, sentence embeddings uh, do not capture the structure of the sentence, whereas the structured uh, embedding uh, does. Next, uh, coming to the motivation behind our work, so uh, our brain uh, does capture everything in this, uh, does not actually capture everything uh, in the same view. For example, while reading uh, the word apple, our brain actually visualizes an image of an apple. Similarly, while observing an image, our brain actually tries to caption. So why do we uh, restrict our decoder to the same view decoding? Why can't we explore something like a cross view decoding? So um, moving ahead, so what actually we try to do is, so how accurately uh, would a model train to decode a concept using a view performed when inferred using another view? So we'll, uh, we'll, I'll describe how, what task we actually introduced uh, for this one. Similarly, we uh, experimented using different transformer based embedding for, for the concept words and things. And uh, given an fMRI equation corresponding to a linguistic stimuli, uh, uh, how accurately uh, can it decode a different uh, view for the same stimuli? And finally, we, uh, we also uh, try to explore which brain areas are actually more activated uh, while doing a particular task or uh, while observing a particular, particular view. So, uh, so uh, coming to the introduction of our work, so unlike previous works which focus only on single view analysis, we study the effectiveness of brain decoding on uh, zero shot cross view learning setup. And observing a good accuracy in it, we actually got the motivation to propose uh, brain decoding in the novel concept of cross view translation tasks like image captioning, image tagging, keyword extraction, and sentence formation. Uh, as uh, discussed uh, above, we also uh, look at how effective the transformer based models uh, are on various brain decoding tasks. And we actually compare them with the traditional uh, global methods. Uh, so this is the methodology for our first uh, task, which was the zero shot cross view. So we actually, if you notice, we actually uh, train our decoder, this decoder, on the WB, which stands for the word plus picture view. So a picture along with the concept word written at the bottom. So we train our model on the word plus picture view, and we actually test it on the fMRI corresponding uh, to the uh, word cloud view. So this is a cross view. Like the model was trained on word plus picture view, fMRI corresponding to word plus picture view, and tested on word plus word cloud view. And we actually get the embedding. So this was uh, the decoder proposed methodology for the uh, cross view decoding, zero shot cross view decoding. Uh, so uh, similar thing has been described in this diagram. So if you actually see the coder was trained on uh, fMRI corresponding to view one, and and basically tested on uh, if you see tested on uh, brain imaging for uh, view two. So the input was given for view two to a decoder which was trained on view one. Similarly, uh, input was given for view three for the same decoder which was trained on view one. Uh, 
the evolution metric uh, that we used uh, was the pairwise accuracy and it has been so it has been described above uh, here and coming to the uh, results and the cognitive insights for the experiment so as uh, we can uh, see in the chart above so it, it reports the actually the pairwise and rank based accuracy uh, sentence view uh, gives the best accurate, uh, best cross view accuracy if you uh, notice uh, here uh, model trained on a sentence view and tested on all the three the word plus the sentence and word plus the so if you see a sentence view was able to give best accuracy uh, let's say uh, on all the three views so let's say uh, sentence was able to record a word plot with 0.67 accuracy whereas word whereas picture view or the word plot view were actually reporting a lesser accuracy uh, for the word plot similarly sentence was able to record best for sentences compared to word plot and uh, uh, word plus picture view uh, so it is interesting to note that the word cloud view was not uh, good uh, was not decoded good enough by the word cloud view but was decoded but was decoded better by the uh, sentence uh, this chart actually uh, shows the contribution of different boxes uh, uh, like uh, contribution different areas so dvld stands for uh, dmn area visual area language area and task possible area these are the main areas and what were their uh, the contribution of percent, the percentage of like contribution of boxes uh, for uh, like by decoding these different tasks so uh, you can actually see from the brain plots that there are a high activations in the visual area of the brain uh, for the uh, word plus picture view while uh, the language area of the brain have more activations in the other two sentence and word problem so uh, a good enough accuracy in the zero shot cross view decoding uh, task motivated us to explore the cross view uh, translation task so to enable these tasks it was critical to build a direct pairwise relationship between different views so hence we augmented the data set with manually labeled pairwise relationship so we added captions and tags for the images uh, keywords for the sentences and sentences uh, that were basically found out uh, from the words from the word plot uh, so uh, coming to what experiments we proposed uh, the experiments were namely image captioning as you can see uh, we used the fmri uh, from the image and we actually tried to decode the caption which was let's say for the for this image the caption was a colorful word sitting on a branch similarly image tagging which actually predicted the tags from the images from the uh, fmri corresponding to image so the tags can be a color object uh, anything that we can notice in the image uh, similarly uh, so similarly uh, the, the third task was sentence formation which was actually uh, predicting a sentence that were actually formed out of the words uh, uh, used in the uh, used from the uh, word cloud and the last task was keyword extraction which was actually extracting the keyword uh, from the uh, sentence so fmri of the sentence was used and actually and it was used to predict the uh, keywords from the sentence coming to the result section so we actually uh, evaluate using two similar to the previous experiment we actually evaluate using two different uh, metrics the pairwise and rank based accuracy both of these uh, accuracies for all the four tasks are reported in the first plot at the top so we can see a good enough pairwise accuracy of like of 0.78 for the uh, image captioning task, 0.83 for the IT task, 0.84 for the uh, KE, which is the keyword extraction task, and points as a point as around 0.75 for the sentence formation uh, task. Coming to the plot below, which marks the contribution of voxels from different brain areas in the uh, in different uh, like uh, the cross view translation task. So we can observe a high high percentage of visual voxels are involved in the IC and IT task. These, uh, Taller bar plot, and whereas a high percentage of language voxels were involved in the uh, sentence formation and the KE task. So, if you observe, compare all the four uh, areas of the KE task, so language has the IE. Similarly, for SF also, the language has the IE. Whereas for IT and IC task, the visual are the uh, Next, a similar pattern as discussed uh, in the previous slide uh, is being observed on the uh, brain plots. So, if you see the IC and IT task, this lower uh, area has a greater uh, activation which is actually corresponding to the visual area whereas for the ke and sf task the uh, uh, above areas have a higher activation which actually corresponds to the uh, language area. so uh, here i, I end me uh, end these slides uh, yeah thank you jashan and the team yeah uh, now the uh, questions please i, I have any a, questions couple, yeah yeah i have a couple of questions so pretty interesting work i am but i have not understood so is this uh, are we predicting what from the fmri what the person is thinking or what is the oh, 
that uh, kind of text he might have simulated in his, uh, you know, in his brain or in his mind, so as to speak. Is that what is this topic about, or uh, is it about figuring out which uh, area is activated for visual stimulus, language stimulus? I mean, like, uh, uh, oh, I mean, like, and why why are we using this cross view decoder or I mean, encoder decoder architecture? Yeah, perhaps I didn't get the central theme of the problem, so that's why maybe there is this confusion. So our main task, uh, as you told, like the main task was to actually decode what a person is like, uh, what a person is thinking, or actually what it is observing. So if it's if he's reading the text, so we can actually tell, like we we try to build a model which which can actually tell what uh, he has read or what image he has seen. So, uh, so what was the accuracy on that actually? Like, for example, like if, 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 for example, are you saying if I'm reading your name, uh, Yashin Arora, uh, mm -hmm. from the F, uh, or, or, you know, uh, so from the fMRI scan, you, you are predicting that I'm reading this, is, is uh, that what you are? What actually you are reading? Yes. And what is the accuracy at, uh, uh, of that particular, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so currently, uh, in the in this field, uh, there's there there's an issue like we we have a less data set. So, so on that data set, we actually train very simple models, ridge regression models, and so there's an interesting two v two accuracy that is divide, uh, like that is proposed for uh, such experiments. So, an accuracy of around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 is generally observed for these stuff. No, so that is, uh, are they uh, going to go through the same kind of passages that they have already been given or any anything that the person reads can be uh, uh, predicted? Or is it is it like you are predicting based on a, a certain data set which you are given to the, to the so candidate and... It's actually, uh, yeah. So it's actually based on a data set, but... Uh, there has been variations in the data set. Uh, we have sentences, like it's like a hierarchy. We have sentences from a broad broad topic and there are various subtopics in that broad topic. So basically it's like broad topics, subtopics and four to five sentences related to the subject. So these sentences can be similar to the sentences that we read previously or can be completely different. Yeah, so, so yeah, so for example, in your results, like do you have results where uh, the person is thinking uh, or, or reading a sentence which is completely different and uh, you are able to predict or you need more deeper levels of fMRI scan for it. Is the current scanning process enough? So, uh, so actually when we divide our data set into train and test, uh, we have been very careful whether while uh, the training should be on should be on different topics and testing should be on different topics so that the sentences might be like the, the training is on basically different topics, different types of sentences, different concepts. Yeah, no, uh, okay, you're not able to play. I mean, uh, I was wanting to see the results on uh, on the sentence, I mean, like the inference results for it. Uh, so, uh, I like... And uh, also one uh, thing here is uh, how much of, uh, I mean, like you, you have a cross view synthesis between the fMRI scan and your own uh, language encoder, right? Kind of, no. At the inference time, you, you only take data only from the scan. A scan from a different view, basically. If, uh, training was actually done on the, let's say, for, for images, we, uh, whether we can predict uh, which concept was image based on. That was the training done, and testing was actually done on sentences. Whether from a sentence, that model can predict the concept. So uh, testing uh, was done on sentences, meaning like what is the input here, the fMRI scan or the sentence? So I am not able to actually share my screen. That could be done. Oh, okay. Or maybe we can go go back in video. Uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to like of point seven eight for the so maybe I'm trying to infer so where to go. There's a methodology picture. Uh, for the, uh, what, yeah, is, what was decoded back, right? Actually, decoding uh, a lesson. Uh, 
coming to the uh, results and the cognitive process. So, ah, yeah, this one, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, notice uh, that the first task was to actually predict the concept only. So, so uh, the the model was trained on the picture view, which was so fMRI corresponding to the picture, and the task was to actually predict the concept. And okay. And it was actually, if you see, tested on another the fMRI corresponding to a different view, which was actually the word cloud and the sentences view, to predict the concept. Same concept. So, so uh, yeah, here is my uh, question. So, the uh, how much of so is the word uh, uh, that are we only taking the 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 uh, fMRI decoder, or is there an input from that uh, image also that is going? In? No, 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 there is no input from the image. So it's That's actually right. fMRI corresponding to the image, and output is actually the concept that is BERT. BERT means what? B R T. No, B I R D. BERT. So the image is corresponding to a bird, right? Okay. So we try to predict that the image is corresponding to a bird or a camera or a person. Okay. This is on the visual stimulus. On the language stimulus, what was that? You were... So language was actually sentences. Uh, with a base, like with a concept word in in the sentence. Let's say a sentence about a bird. There's a bird is flying in the sky. And uh, you would want to predict the the concept word. Uh, concept word. Yeah. So that was the base data set, base experiment, which actually supported our cross view translation task, which were actually image capturing, image size. So the rest of the hmm. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. So did was this published somewhere or? So it's under review at uh, NACL. Okay. Okay. So that's nice uh, discussion. So yeah, maybe we you can uh, have an often chat also, and maybe Jason, you can take the comments from Professor Madhav, and maybe you can put it more analysis points. Okay. Sure. So let's move to the next one. Um, let me start it. Yeah, so the seventh one is a uh, 3D digitization of classical Indian dance performances. Uh, it's from Center for Visual Information Technology. So the team is uh, Jinka Sai Sagar, Astistva Srivastav, Chandradeep Pukaria, and uh, Dr. Ravinash Sharma. So let me play the video. Hi, everyone. I am Astitva Srivastav. I am an MS third year student working with Dr. Ravinash Sharma in CVIT lab. I am here to present our work on 3D digitization of classical Indian dance performances. There exist a lot of classical dance styles in India such as Bharatnatyam, Kuchipudi, Kathak etc. and our objective is to digitize them. With the advent of metaverse, we want such a representation that can easily import it, for example, into a VR environment. And the solution is to go with 3D representation. The whole idea of digitizing dance performance falls under the area of non-rigid 3D capture, where a person is moving in a space, performing some dynamic actions, and we want to capture the geometry of that person for each point in time and later visualize it in some virtual environment. Now there exist a lot of challenges in this setup. For example, self occlusions where one body part occludes the another body part, clothing obstructions, lack of surface structure means we do not know the material of the surface and how does it interact with the light, background clutter and obviously the classical sensor noise. In order to represent the underlying geometry, we need to choose some sort of 3D representation. Now, there exists a lot of 3D representations, such as point cloud, where we sample points on the underlying geometry. Each point in the point cloud holds an XYZ position in the 3D space. We can also associate RGB values with each point to get a color point cloud. Then there comes this mesh representation, which is essentially a wireframe-like structure. It is a graph made up of nodes and edges where the connectivity of edges and nodes form a polygon, in most cases a triangle. So mesh is a more accurate representation of the underlying surface as compared to point cloud. Third one is volumetric where we represent the 3D object using voxels. Just like an image is made up of pixels, 
a 3D object is made up of voxels. So voxels are just like 3D extension of the pixels. Now let's uh, first focus on a static capture where a person is standing still and not doing some dynamic actions. This is the 360 degree view of the capture that we have taken using our setup and we can easily appreciate the folds and wrinkles it has captured on the dhoti part. So this static capture scenario is relatively easier but when it comes to temporal setup where the person is moving in the 3D space and performing dynamic actions we need multiple sensors which can operate simultaneously with almost no lag and can capture the depth and RGB information from multiple views in order to reconstruct the whole 3D body. So in the image you can see our setup where we have four Kinect cameras which are the highest grade industrial 3D cameras. Here you can see the raw output of the Kinect cameras where we have four RGB images and four depth images coming from four different views. In the depth images you can observe there is there's a lot of flickering and the small noise which is coming because of the inaccuracy in the depth estimation by the sensor. So this is the temporally evolving 3D geometry reconstructed from the raw RGB and depth images that we got from Kinect. Here you can observe there's a lot of noise on the surface as well as there are some major holes in the 3D geometry which is coming from because of self occlusions. So whenever the hand is in front of the chest it occludes the camera view thereby leaving a hole in the chest. And there is the same uh, 3D body visualized from different view. So in order to reconstruct the 3D geometry from raw RGB and depth images we use an algorithm called TSDF and we perform hole filling on top of it in order to fill in those missing regions that were missing because of the self occlusions. In order to remove the surface noise coming from the sensor, we track important parts in the geometry highlighted by these spheres and we minimize something called non-rigid tracking error over the time in order to suppress this noise and refine the geometry. Here you can see the refined geometry in sort of a rainbow colored visualization and you can also see the highlighted noise in red on top of the refined surface. And here is a side by side comparison of the noisy input and the refined geometry. So first we estimate the 3D pose of the person from the RGB image and then we fit SMPL on top of it which is essentially a parametric representation of the underlying human body. Turns out we can use this SMPL in order to drive the static scan we have captured earlier. So we can transfer the pose information from the underlying SMPL to the static scan and animate it. For example, here you can see the information of the underlying SMPL being transferred to the static scan and you can see the geometry of that person deforming over the time. We can also adopt learning based methods to infer depth maps directly from the RGB input without the need of any depth sensor. We developed one such framework called SHARP Shape Aware Reconstruction of People in Loose Clothing. The input to our framework is an RGB image which we first used to estimate a SMPL body. This SMPL body is then converted to a field representation which is essentially a four layered depth map representation. This field SMPL along with input RGB image is passed to a common encoder which encodes this information and passes it to three decoder branches. The first branch predicts the RGB field maps the second branch predicts the auxiliary peel maps and the third branch predicts the residual deformation peel maps. We then finally fuse the auxiliary and residual deformation peel maps to generate the final depth maps which can be back projected to form the point cloud. 
these are the results that we have obtained using our method the output of our framework is a point cloud which can be easily converted to a mesh facial expressions are a major part of any indian classical dance form so we also focus to retain detailed facial expressions in 3d as accurate as possible and here are the results of that and obviously the hands they are the major storyteller in any classical dance form so we want to retain the highly accurate hand poses along with highly realistic textures so this is again the result of our static capture system and we can observe that we were able to retain highly detailed hand geometry however deep neural network requires a lot of data in order to learn so we also resort to synthetic data we set up our own synthetic data generation pipeline where we exploited synthetic humans and put them into arbitrary poses with some predefined hand poses so basically we use 32 asamyutta hast mudras for each hast mudra we render 2500 images so our data set has uh, around 80000 rgb images with segmentation mask for both hands depth map for both hands 3d joint location and 3d mesh for both hands so we have trained a deep neural network on our synthetic data and these are the initial results you can observe that for a given rgb image of a hand the network trained on our synthetic data was able to reconstruct the 3d geometry accurately we have been putting our work into various conferences and journals also for more details you can check our web page thanks for listening ha uh, oh, jinka are you there or who's there hi uh, this is astit here i'll be uh, representing yeah so this uh, reconstruction which you get is um uh is is in the metric scale right because your kinect uh, cameras are calibrated with respect to one another in terms of where they are yes, positioned yes sir yes sir everything is in metric scale uh but the original uh the 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 typical smpl algorithm doesn't uh, give it in metric scale it, it gives in the smpl what you say like a canonical body center thing right I mean, which is to say you wouldn't get the depth uh, from from the from the image like so i have an image or i uh, of a, of a of a human pose i can get this uh, shape uh, body model and i can get a a pose of it but but that is in the canonical frame i wouldn't know what it is with respect to my camera frame right i mean like uh, that's the traditional original papers were like that i don't know what's the state of the art can we for example other papers directly which do the pose and depth with respect to a single camera or you need these kind of calibrated yeah, so sir uh, what currently papers assume is uh, a weak perspective camera model and they whatever the smpl coordinates are they are with respect to the camera coordinate which is in weak perspective camera model which assumes like around 5000 focal length and camera center is uh, like uh, just the center of the image and uh, so it is arbitrary focal length uh, which bar we yeah. you know like this is a high i mean like, yeah. yeah yeah so like for uh, every rgb image it uh, the network predicts the camera parameters also yeah but i think asked the question was the mother is asking do can you get the uh, absolute depth estimation right which is not true so we only get the object uh, human body reconstructed in the camera coordinate frame um it is does that answer your question mother uh no like uh, but do we get yeah you get the no the smpl is not in the camera coordinate frame right? that's in the body frame if i'm not wrong i may be wrong but no, no we estimate that in the camera coordinate frame okay it's weak perspective modeling so we also estimate the this parameters to estimate the camera and yes. then uh, yeah so we get this everything 
So the depth feeling that we do, we do it in the camera coordinate frame only. So we do get the depth of the person with respect to the camera, but is this uh, true depth or is it from scale depth? Or? It is not true depth, that's what I'm saying. It is in the estimated depth in the weak perspective model, with the camera coordinate frame only, yeah. Not the absolute depth. Okay. Sure, I... Since we're doing a monocular reconstruction, we don't need to integrate multi-view. But the, these were from uh, multiple connect, right? Which are placed in the... No, no, no. So there are two, two threads, I think you got confused. One was on uh, reconstruct, so having a data set, right? So for example, the neuron deformation graph paper and DF2 net are not our group paper. We are using them to get a temporally consistent reconstruction. And then we want to train something on top of it. So temporally consistent reconstructed human is still a very difficult problem and especially with loose clothing and all. Mm -hmm. So we are moving one step at a time. So even getting this high resolution or high quality data for that is hard and uh, not many data sets are there. Static data sets have started coming. Okay. One of them be ours also that we have collected with 250 Indian uh, human body scans at Triple IT. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those things are, we have, the idea of the this presentation was to focus on what we are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of novelty that IGCV under review paper is basically what he presented, which is doing a monocular reconstruction, not multi-view. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that if maybe if you're okay, you could send that uh, sometime. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. It's an archive already, I'll share. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. Wonderful work. Uh, yeah, uh, please, maybe we can. Any other questions or we could move to the next participant? Yeah, I think uh, we can move to the next one because we have short of. Oh yeah, time we should and, also. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting work. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so we'll move to the next one. Um, greetings to all. The title of. Yeah. So the this is the last presentation, a last demo of uh, today's uh, showcase session. So it's from Center for IT. Uh, and agriculture, uh, uh, agriculture, and the uh, title is the a crop crop darpa, a crop diagnostic tool. So the team is uh, Ravind Garamsethi and Professor Pri Krishna Reddy. So so let me play the video. Greetings to all. The title of my presentation is Crop Darpa, a crop diagnostic tool. So the outline of this presentation is as follows. First, I will demo the crop darpan system. Later on, I will explain the important concepts employed to build the crop darpan system. Uh, the motivation is simple, and uh, the crop darpan is a smartphone-based uh, crop problem identification system. Uh, it will help every farmer who has a smartphone uh, in detecting crop problems. Motivation is simple. Most of the farmers will have high-end mobile phones with internet connectivity. And uh, during the course of time, we are going to have more educated farmers. The research question we posed about four years back was how to build a smartphone-based application to guide the farmer to identify the field problem and get a solution for the given crop. The crop may suffer from several problems, including 40 to 50 problems. How to help the farmer to detect any problem is facing. So the use case is simple. Uh, farmer poses a smartphone and visits the farm. After seeing his crop problem in person, the farmer uses the proposed tool to identify the crop problem. So he is going with the smartphone. The smartphone contains the tool. So the tool will help him to identify the crop problem. It basically, it's a question answer based system we develop. So the advantages are huge, actually. So every farmer become independent. They will be empowered. Also, uh, they can learn new things. So we named this uh, tool as a crop darpan. Uh, darpan is a word. So you have to do simple thing. Go to Google App Store and uh, download the crop darpan app. It is already active. Thousands of farmers are using this crop darpan system. It is currently available for cotton and rice crop. So that's why I told you, you have to download the app from the smartphone. You have to visit the crop. Assume that you are a owner of that crop. Or your object is to find out the problem. So just do whatever the tools say. 
and answer the question. It will help you to identify the crop problem you are facing. So I'm going to demo here. So this is the kind of, uh, if you download the tool, this kind of screen that will appear, you can select the appropriate crop. The two options will come. If you don't know the, this is name of the, the crop, maybe cotton and rice, you are in the rice field, you have to click this. If you know the disease name, you have to click this. Suppose uh, if you click this, you want to identify the problem in the rice, it will put the following questions in Telugu language, English language, any language. First, we're demonstrating with the English language. Do you observe seedling problem? Do you observe problem on leaf? Problem in leaves? Do you observe problem in stem? So if you are having a crop problem, uh, problem in the crop, you should say yes to at least one question. If you are unable to say yes, your crop is fine. That's what we are saying. Uh, suppose you are, do you have a, uh, do you observe any presence of insect? If you find insect, you can say yes. Then it will pose next level of questions. Uh, you can read this. Do you observe any excuvia, sooty mold at the base of the plant? Do you observe any long, slender, greenish brown bulbs on panicles only during evening hours? A farmer can easily understand the questions and uh, say yes by seeing in person. If you say yes, automatically. Uh, this is name of the crop problem is ear red bug and gundi bug. These are the corresponding images. images, And uh, this is the chemical advice. These are the symptoms you confirm. So then you can go to pesticide shop and buy the pesticides and spray. So you can go to uh, uh, any uh, question and uh, you can follow different options. And uh, you can play with this tool and let me know. Uh, let us know if there is any problem. You can select cotton price, whatever it is. The other option is, if you know that this is name, it is very simple. Uh, it will just look up the table. It will identify the crop problem. Suppose if you know that uh, you are facing the brown plant over problem, automatically it will display advice. Simple, straightforward. This is the existing book we replicated. That's what websites are doing now. So for the rice, we have 37 problems. And uh, for the cotton also, we have 30 to 40 problems. This is the kind of trees we developed, actually. It works following trees manner. Uh, I hope you understood how it is going. Just to, to demonstrate, to give an idea of how it will work. Uh, then uh, these are the, some of the trees. You can see uh, that what inside thing that is happening. So the background is simple. Uh, it is developed as a part of Indo-Japan joint project, it was, which was executed preceding four years. Background is simple. Most of the farmers are not getting actionable agriculture information, even though after several years of independence, it, you know, it is a little bit major issue. Overall, you know, systems can be divided into, existing system can be divided into full-based systems, push-based systems, hybrid systems, call center knowledge portals, governments are building, they are not helping farmers, they are helping only some farmers. We build personal information system, we solve the farm level system, we also build hybrid system. By exploiting the experiences of these two systems, we, we have come up with the crop reference system. For the building crop therapy system, we exploit, exploited generalization, specialization concept uh, from database system. Also, 20 question game, logic of 20 question game, we daily use to children play this game. Also, we also exploited human in the loop logic. For example, uh, if you want to know this image, here are aeroplanes, easy to say for you. It's easy to say for machine learning system, coerce granularity. But if you say pincher bunt, very difficult to say. There's a little difference between pincher bunt. But if you ask the questions at the feature level, it's easy to say. So the machine learning systems are unable to identify this kind of thing. It's very difficult. So, but uh, you can pose some questions in the belly white or the eyes white, the bird is the parakeet athlete. You are asking some questions based on features. Somebody saying yes or no. Same logic is applied for crop therapy. Uh, people ask me, why don't you build image-based system? Uh, my answer to that is, if image-based system, building of image-based system was possible, it would have been built already. But we don't see any image-based system, comprehensive system, which is helping farmers. It is difficult, actually, it's a difficult problem. Those who know machine learning will appreciate my stand. Somebody have a, want to argue, they can argue me, with me. Because a typical crop may suffer from 50 different problems, and each problem may have different stages. Take larvae, pupa, and adults. A lot of training data is required. Uh, so far, I told you more significant outcome. Developing comprehensive image only system is difficult. We have to resort to human in the loop system. Proposed system is question answer based. It is not a machine learning system. Yeah, so we understood the perception gap of farmers, how farmers perceive the problem. We, we had a field study. Most of the farmers doesn't recognize the crop problem. They only they identify the perceptions. Whites inside, holes on leaves kind of thing. 
or rice crop, small number of perceptions. We identify, uh, farmers are able to identify high level perception. Scientists are able to identify the crop problem with low level perception. For example, farmers say it's a leaf curl in the cotton crop. Scientists will say white fly, happy, trips, mildew bug, jazz seed, one of these problems because he is seeing these perceptions, one, some of the perceptions valid. But each perception can be converted into a question and you can build an hierarchy. We can render them systematically. This was the logic, and we are successfully built for cotton and rice crop. These are the white fly, aphids, trips, mealy bug, jacids, leaf curl virus, zinc deficiency. So the question is that uh, we have to build an hierarchy of the symptoms, perceptions, and convert them into questions, and we are rendering logic. So overall, the status is as follows. Logic has been built, methodology has been built. We are demonstrated for cotton and rice crops. We exploited logic from association rules, coverage patterns, concept hierarchies, question answering system, decision trees, database system, pattern mining techniques, perception engineering. We exploited all the techniques and built a workable system. It is working. You can go and check it. The uh, system is scalable to all crops, all farmers, all regions, all countries, with location specific, personalized, language specific, dialect specific. So we want to expand it to 200 crops. So we want your collaboration. If anybody is interested, I can put up another app for within three months. I got a methodology. It has worked for cotton rice crop. Why can't it work for other crops? And all languages. And now we, as a part of research side, uh, uh, we can enhance conversational intelligence, artificial intelligence on the top of it and, uh, and uh, ease the use of the crop platform system. This is the team. A lot of people have worked, a lot of students have worked. And uh, the crop platform system has the potential help poor and marginal and elated farmers can touch and benefit every family, improve the income of poor and marginal farmers, provides a cost effective opportunity to help the farmer, an opportunity to create a next green agricultural revolution is a potential cloud computing application. And thank you very much. And uh, if you have any comments, uh, please write to me. And uh, my address is here. And uh, with this, uh, I'm stopping here. Uh, I'm ending the, my presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Krishna Reddy, and uh, for the grassroots problem addressing the issues. Yeah, so I think uh, with us, Aravind Gadamsati is there for any questions related to this. He can answer. So, any questions for the team? Okay, I have a one quick and small question. That uh, so um, the tool which is uh, developed is for assuming that the farmers do not know their uh, um, solution for a given uh, disease. Even they sometimes they fail to identify this disease, right? So any statistics on this? That means how much percentage of the farmers are not able to identify the uh, this kind of uh, information that indeed there is a disease is occurring in the crop or uh, how, what is the solution for that crop, crop disease? Any statistics on this? Uh, I it actually like, uh, so this tool is like, uh, to, you can say, exploiting the uh, visual perception a farmer has about his crop, like uh, the visual signal he can see. So based on that, we are uh, posing questions. Uh, correct, so, correct. so, but, uh, in this, you are assumed that the farmer may not know how to diagnose that this is right. So that's yeah. the reason you try to get give some questions so that you are going to help the farmer to identify what is the disease is that right. So yeah. could you have some statistics how much percentage of the farmers do not have this information? Information means uh, they don't know they, they are unable to find the disease. Oh, uh, my yeah. my answer. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Yes, sir. basically this before this project, uh, there was another project which is called ISAGU, uh, which has uh, like uh, the implementation duration of almost to 10 to 14 years. So in those 10 to 14 years, uh, what actually happened was um, the agriculture scientists and all, uh, they will visit the farms, they will take the photographs and they will ask the farmers. Okay. So uh, from there, uh, yeah. From all this experience only, we understood that it's not like a, uh, a statistically based uh, Doctor, uh, assumption. It is we, more of a... Should we move to the next session now? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I think, yeah, maybe I will uh, uh, reach you offline. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Arvind. So we are uh, short of the time. So thank you, Professor Madhav and Nimiya. So now I hand over to you so we can carry on. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Chiranjeevi, for anchoring this uh, program. And uh, I hand it over to Avinash, uh, who is uh, already ready and, uh, to get going. Yeah, please, the floor is yours. Uh,